Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and happy Pride. It's Pride Week here in San Francisco. And so I'm excited to kick off Pride Week with this special program tonight. If you're here for the first time or the first time hearing of the Michelle Miao Show, well, the Michelle Miao Show is your A through Z covering the LGBT, LMNOP, and everyone in between. <laughs> All right, tonight is a very special program, uh, and I'm so grateful to the Alzheimer's Association for being a great partner with us in bringing this panel to us. I think, you know, the, the best way that we can kick off the program is to have our speakers, our esteemed speakers, introduce themselves in their respective roles so that we can all understand exactly what they do. So when you do have a question, we can ask them appropriately. And so we'll start with the doc, Xiao Rong, please introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Xiao Yong O. Oh. Uh, I, I, I got my PhD from University of Southern California uh, in neurobiology. I'm interested in the, how the brain works and how it changes um, when you age. And then I later got interested in the age-related disease. And now I work for Alzheimer's Association. I'm the uh, community engagement manager um, and also research champions at the um, Alzheimer's Association uh, Northern California and Northern Nevada chapters. Stan. Hi, my name is Stan Wong and I am an Alzheimer's volunteer. I was a caregiver for both my parents. Uh, my mother had a uh, vascular dementia after having a stroke, and then my father uh, had a slight case of dementia, and after my mom passed, it became really severe, and he ended up having 24-7 care at home. But um, I learned a lot. That's what I can share with you this evening. Hi, everyone. My name is Jarmin Ye. I'm an assistant professor at the Institute for Health and Aging at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, I feel very lucky to be here on behalf of my colleague, Jason Flatt, who was unable to be here, but Dr. Flatt's a professor at University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, and my research area broadly looks at social justice issues that impact the quality of life of community dwelling older adults, people living with dementia and caregivers. So very happy to be here. Thank you so much. I think, you know, the first question that I had, and I'm going to wrap this question into it as we were in the green room and I felt really shy to ask this question and almost felt, you know, embarrassed that it's a little ignorant, but I didn't know the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's. And so if we could have the panelists here, you know, tell us what's the difference between the two and what exactly are the two um, descriptions of the disease. So we'll start with the doc. Me? <laughs> yes, you. Oh, okay. uh. um, so um, dementia is, is like mostly described the symptoms so it's like the, uh, the Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementias. And then besides Alzheimer's, uh, so it's like um, 60 to 80% of dementia is caused by Alzheimer's disease. So when we call it a, a collection of symptoms that we call it dementia. So the symptom and the, the cause difference is like when you have a fever that that's the symptoms. And what caused that fever? It could be a cold, it could be an infection, and that's the disease that you had to go see a doctor to find out what is the disease caused that fever. And then they find out, and then you can treat that disease. So it's similar. So in a lot of people get confused with um, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. They thought it was the same thing. It actually is different. So um, the most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, and it has also have uh, vascular disease, vas vascular dimensions, and they have uh, frontal temporal dimensions, and they have Lewy body dementia, and then some other less common kinds of dimensions. Anything to add, Stan? Um, I'm kind of more of a visual person, so I think, and I saw a great graphic at the Alzheimer's Association, so I think of, think of dementia as the umbrella. And underneath that umbrella, we actually have Alzheimer's, frontal temporal, vascular dementia, as well as Lewy body disease. So they're all part of dementia. 
So it, to me, it was a simpler way of just visualizing, like, okay, it's all part of this, because we hear a lot of the word Alzheimer's, but it's all part of dementia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that umbrella metaphor. I feel like that makes it very clear. I'm also very <laughs> visual. Um, but uh, as already expressed, dementia is, is a more of a, a generic term that really is describing a set of symptoms. Um, and then underneath that, there are specific types of dementia. So Alzheimer's disease being the most common. Um, and I really think that um, you know, one of the fascinating things, which we might get into later, is that, um, you know, from a diagnosis standpoint, that's quite difficult. The best we can really do is screen and detect for dementia, uh, but to diagnose is, is much more difficult and, and almost impossible. I mean, to really get a clear diagnosis, it's usually until postmortem, and I think Shelron can speak a little bit more to that, but I just want to pull out that nuance. Before we get into the clinical side of the discussion, uh, of course, we'll cover that. Um, I, I think it's so important, especially today, tonight, we're addressing this topic with the lens of looking at it from an AAPI and LGBTQIA plus perspective, right? It's intersectional in this way. Culturally speaking, I mean, when the Alzheimer's Association had reached out to me about this topic, I, I, it, it just hit me in a, in a very, very specific way. I had been thinking about this from a very personal perspective. Could my mother be showing early signs of dementia? I didn't want to talk about it, and you know, maybe this is a cultural thing. But perhaps the panel here can help us you know, get jump started on some of the other societal impacts that we'll talk about a little later on. How does this topic affect you? And if you've got a personal story, feel free to share. Um, why you know, have an interest in this topic, especially affecting the LGBTQIA plus AAPI community? Sharon. Um, I think I, I got interested in the um, age-related disease, and then um, I mostly was uh, doing research, basic research in the lab, um, in university, um, and also in some biotech company like Genentech and Sios. Um But I feel like <laughs> I have more impact when I work for Alzheimer's Association that I actually interact with the um, families and caregivers. I, I can use my knowledge to help them instead of in the basic research. It could be like years <laughs> before my research make any impact on anybody. So that way, um, yeah, that's the main reason I joined Alzheimer's Association. I felt like um, my knowledge can help somebody um, make an impact, and then it's like every day go to work. It's it's just like make it worthwhile that I'm actually helping people. Yeah, mm, and we're, I we're think lucky it's, to have it's, you. Yeah, I I think I did a lot of like community outreach and do um, presentations and and education to raise the awareness. Um, about the early signs of the disease and also make people aware of there's a lot of resources out there. So they had to, you know, um, when they first recognize those early signs and they can start going to see a doctor and get a diagnosis and start um, searching for community resources that can help them. That's very important because when i doing some support group, I keep having people telling me, oh, my mom had that um, signs years ago, but we didn't know it's, you know, Alzheimer's. So I feel, especially now that um, research making advances and we have some um, intervention that is, is going to be um, address the biological <laughs> process of the disease that's only work um, for uh, MCI, that's mild cognitive impairments, and also early signs of Alzheimer's, uh, early stage of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So it's getting more important now that we have people to, you know, um, get a diagnosis early. Mm -hmm. And a lot of research has shown that um, change in your brain actually happens like um, years before the clinical signs appear. So um, Alzheimer's Association had done a lot of the um, advancing the researchers and um, 
support the research, and then um, we hope that we have um, make it possible that can you know uh, make an early detection and intervent early, and then maybe one day we will uh, realize our mission. Um, that's a world without Alzheimer's. We're, we'll definitely get to the end of the program where we talk about the world without Alzheimer's. Stan. Yes, um, I'm a, a son of immigrant parents. So my father came from Toisan in um, Canton, China. And my mom's actually ancestry is actually also from Canton. So kind of being brought up very traditional and the, uh, the whole idea of honor and respect and you're supposed to take care of your parents. And you know when that finally came up, where I was, I was like taking over medical as well as financial decisions. There was also the part too of like, okay, we can't talk about this. And just like you were saying, is like, and within the Chinese culture, it's like you don't talk about things like death and negative things because you're inviting that into your home. So you don't talk about it. So for me, trying to take care of my mother at the time first after her stroke, it was like okay, I don't have the skills because where do I go? And that's when I discovered uh, the Alzheimer's uh, uh, sup care, support group. And actually that was the open house. It's an LGBT um, organization and it was great. So you can go there, be with people like yourself, taking care of a partner or taking care of your parents. I couldn't believe how many people were like, okay, I'm taking care of my mom or my dad. And the decisions you have to make as a caregiver, and it was great to learn, okay, what do you do? And learn those skills. So to me, it's like, it, it, and I think for me, getting involved has also been wonderful because so many people, when you mention Alzheimer's, they go, oh, well, I, I know someone who has it. And it's like, okay, what do you do next? to be a good caregiver and also that you can help them. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. yeah. Herman. Well, I'm a sociologist by training, um, social gerontologist specifically, so I think a lot about aging and, and growing older. Um, and I came into doing work in the field of dementia because about one in 10 older adults uh, you know, is at risk of, of dementia. And so that prevalence rate makes it a topic that is, is something that we have to think about and um, from like a thinking about a prevention standpoint, where can we start thinking about intervening at earlier parts of the life course um, to reduce risk factors that put people at higher risk for dementia in later life, and in particular, AAPI and LGBTQIA populations. So I'm a daughter of immigrants. Um, I'm also the oldest daughter, so I, I think a lot about what <laughs> yes. is my role in my family. Um, I witnessed my mom care for my grandparents until their end of life. My grandfather had dementia when he died, you know, and, and I, I saw what toll it took on my mom to care for them in that, those late stages and relocate them into our home, um, renovate the dining room into their bedroom because it was the only suitable floor where they could reasonably stay um, with a bathroom nearby without having to go up and down stairs. So witnessing that um, you know, really made me quite attuned to the burden that families face when they're trying to care for their loved ones. And I am very thankful my parents are quite healthy healthy now, but I do think about their aging, and I am aging, so we are all aging. So these are um, topics that just, you know, having in our minds, as, as Stan said so beautifully, um, you know, it, it's, we, we will know somebody mm -hmm. that has gone through it or is going through it, and so being able to have open conversations about it is really important. Thank you all so much for sharing. Charmin touched on something that is a great segue to the next question, and feel free for others to jump in, but we'll start with, with the doc. That's you, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is data. There's new data that has been collected. There's some research that we can talk about of how dementia and Alzheimer's is affecting the AAPI community, and furthermore, AAPI and LGBTQIA+. So some questions such as, right, is there a rise in cases with a specific ethnic background within the AAPI community? Or uh, is there a rise in cases with those who are AAPI LGBTQIA plus 
or perhaps you know we're now starting to collect the data and we can make sense of how it, these numbers actually affect our community. So tell us about some of the new data or research that we are uncovering. Oh, um, I think there was like 2.7 uh, millions of uh, LGBT um, plus people, um, older adults, um, that uh, that are over um, 50 years. And then I think the LGBT uh, older adults have, um, I think it's 7.4% of them that live in, actually live in with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, actually, I don't have any data that's specific that is like LGBT and also AAPI, that data. And, and actually, um, it, it, it makes a point that like um, a lot of the research that um, I think um, the AAPI participant <laughs> is not that high, um, mostly. So we encourage people to, you know, um, there's a, a USSF have registry um, for people to sign up for research. And so we want to um, increase the um, underrepresented um, minorities um, in the research. So we make sure those intervention we discover in the future will actually, you know, benefit all people. Um, yeah. Thank you. Any, anything more to add? Stan, German? I'll let you go for next. In terms of data, well, certainly um, collecting data is one of the biggest challenges to really push this field forward. Um, and as Xiaorong mentioned, you know, there are registries that exist to try to encourage more inclusion into research studies so that we can better understand, uh, you know, what are, what are people with the lived experiences facing? What are their loved ones facing? Um, so that we can make a case for more resources uh, to go into services, supports, as well as, um, you know, biomedical research as well. Um, but before we even get there, I mean, it's just even sort of um, acknowledging and recognizing that this is something that, that we should speak about. Um, there, there are big barriers to that stigma and fear in particular that keeps this quite under wraps. And so that's part of the challenge to getting some of the numbers, um, clarity on some of the numbers. I think our numbers are quite underreported. Um, and so we can only work with the best data that we have and, and knowing that it's underreported means there's a lot of um, stories being untold. There is data, uh, we have limited data, but um, that's unfortunate, but within the LGBT community, there's a lot of people who are by themselves. So there isn't that infrastructure like a family that's trying to surround someone who is ill and to help them. And unfortunately, uh, that does help that does, uh, that does hurt the LGBT community. What I s hopefully will see in our future is the fact that we've seen our community rise up. They were there during the AIDS crisis of people helping each other out. And as our population is aging, of having people realize that, okay, these people need a little bit more assistance. What can we do to help them? And who's gonna look after them? Because in most cases, like, w and we have data too, the fact that most people, you know, it, the family is, and caregivers are the ones who say, look, we've seen a direct change in their personality. Something is not right. But then if someone is living independently, who are they checking in with? And they just become more reclusive. So that is a problem within our community and that's something that we need to address. Yeah, yeah definitely. I think um, the LGBTQ uh, community is like twice as uh, likely to live alone and, you know, four, three or four times slightly, um, less likely to have children. So their supporting system is, is quite different from, you know, um, compared to other communities. So it's it's something in that um, they are supporting um, network, it's um, sometimes it's not necessarily their biological families, and then it could be their family of choice. So, um, yeah, it, it's there's some special circumstances that it's really uh, special, unique about the uh, LGBTQ communities. Yes. Yeah, which you know you had mentioned those who are at higher risk. Mm. What does that look like? What does that mean? Who in our community are at higher risk? Uh, who in our communities in a higher risk? I think that's, uh, I, I'm talking about the disparity in caring, but the, the, the networks is a special um, 
and also they're less likely to seek help mm -hmm. because um, of their experience. When we're talking about um, dementia, we know this is an age-related disease, and when get, people get older, um, Alzheimer's disease first sign is affect their short term memory and their long term memory remain. Maybe in recent years, in the last twenty years, we we may um, <coughs> excuse me, we made great progress in the inclusive um, inclusion for the LGBTQ community. But maybe um, that's in their short term memory. In their long term memory, they have different experiences, and that will make it hard for them to you know open up and see help. I think that's something also we should consider. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. S Stan? Yeah, one of the things that also affect our community is a lot of people within the OGBT community don't have health care. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole other question. But the whole idea of, you know, of you know, having access to health care is really important during these times where, okay, you know, and it's just not only... Uh, dementia, but other health issues as well, and especially when you're getting older, that they need to have access and have a support network for them. So it's kind of like our own chosen family has to step up to help them. Yeah, and I think a perspective I might add is looking across the life course. So when we talk about Alzheimer's and dementia, we're also talking about brain health and what we can do to support brain health over the course of our lives. Um, in 2020, The Lancet came out with a report that had 12 uh, modifiable risk factors that they identified that could help potentially prevent about 40% of dementias. And some of those risk factors included things like education, smoking, physical activity, air pollution. So things that are very much in our social and physical environments that we can intervene on, we can change um, in some way or another beyond just behavior change. So I think having some attention and investing resources in some of the social and physical infrastructure to really support health across the life course, and then brain health in particular um, can help reduce some of the risk factors that we're talking about. But specifically, I think for AAPI and LGBTQIA populations, you know, we're also grappling with the intersectionality of many different oppressive forces and also complicating uh, biographical and historical arcs that are all coinciding to compound the experiences that people have over the course of their lives that also place them at higher risk. Immigration, violence, trauma um, are all some of the experiences that, that can harm brain health and, and put people at higher risk for dementia. Thank you so much for that. We, we talked a little bit about what the symptoms uh, especially early signs, you know, what that can look like. I'd love to revisit that and and then maybe answer at what point do we pick up the phone or do we we actually say it, we we verbalize it, we articulate it to someone like, I think I need help or I, I need help or a caretaker or, you know, a chosen family member or somebody that advocates for us. I think it's important to for people to understand that, um, Alzheimer's disease or dementia is not part of normal aging. Um, I think in our, uh, at least in our Chinese community that I have with, uh, most contact with, and a lot of people still think that when you're getting old, your memory just get back, you know. But we said um, this is not a normal aging, so it's important for us to go out, reach out to the community and do education and raise the awareness. Like we have like Alzheimer's Association offer um, a lot of the community education programs that's free. Um, any group that are interested in this topic can contact us and then we are happy to come out and do education like the, the 10 warning signs mm. of Alzheimer's disease and you know and also like how to bring up the conversation like um, we mentioned earlier that within the family sometimes it's difficult to bring up the conversation and we have like caregiver trainings um, so um, how to uh, understand and responding to behavior um, um, that related to dementia and also like um, effective communication strategies and also a lot of um, we have um, which, like healthy living for your brain and body that we specifically talk about um, the the problem that uh, um, Jamin had mentioned um, that, that how to reduce the risk and how we can do something about it and we have a 
a whole lot of uh, um, presentation we are um, happy to offer to the community, and we just need um, um, the people help us to reach out if you, you realize that some groups uh, in the community are interesting. Um, just let us know. We are happy to come out to do a lot of education um, presentations free. And we offer it in English, in Chinese, and also in Spanish. And so, yeah, we trying to reach out to the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Stan. Yeah, one of the things we, uh, the Alzheimer's Association offers is a 24-7 helpline. It's 1-800-272-3900. And they speak, what, over 100 languages? Um, we have over 200, 200? languages yes. um, translation over the phone. So it, it doesn't matter if you don't speak English. Right. Yeah. So for people who are saying, who've got questions, and either as a caregiver or somebody who thinks that, I don't think this is right and I don't feel right. It's like they can call and we can help them. And one of the examples, it's always kind of fun where people think, I think I'm developing dementia. And I was like, well, what's happened? And it's like, well, I forgot my car keys. I can't find them. I said, did you find them? They go, yeah. So the best example is, okay, when you can't find your car keys, when you, when you get in your house or house keys, you think, okay, what happens? I came into the house, I had my bag of groceries, I went to the kitchen, I dropped that off, and then I had to take my coat off. You retrace your steps. Sometimes it's in the door in the front, but at least you could do that. Somebody with dementia can't remember that, those steps. So it's like there are these things that are part of the 10 warning signs too that you kind of look for and you go kind of, it's a checklist for yourself to say, mm -hmm. Do I have any of these? Mm -hmm. So it's a. Uh, I'm glad that we're you know we're we do have a helpline where people can call, and privately ask somebody for like help. And I've heard several people who were like so grateful that it was available to them. Yeah. And I might just add that, um, you know, it's not a consistent thing, the signs and symptoms. Um, people can be quite functional in many ways. And um, if they are experiencing memory loss, it may not be a daily thing. It might not be the same thing that they're forgetting. And so, you know, it, it can be hard to detect for those reasons. Um, and it's not a sort of a zero sum game where it's like you, you have your cognition the next day it's gone. It's quite progressive. And so I think again, having uh, some of the resources that were already mentioned can give you some indicators as to when, okay, maybe we need to have a conversation or okay, maybe I should bring this up with my physician the next time I go for a regular checkup just to start having the conversation if you have any feeling or indication that maybe that should be a, um, some dialogue that you should be getting started and, and getting the ball rolling on. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, doctor. I think it's important for people to realize um, <clears throat> Alzheimer's disease and dementia not just affecting the memory, so it can affect your um, uh, judgment, your thinking, um, your uh, personalities and like your language abilities and um, your orientation that like you go to a place that you didn't know how you know how do you get there and how, how do you get home and a lot of things that uh, it changes not just memory I think people maybe most people think it's a memory problem but not necessary um, cognitive abilities is it's like um, have a lot of like aspect of it yeah so. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, Stan, I think you were the one that brought up uh, access to health care as a barrier, you know, for many of us in the community. Let's explore that a little bit. Um, give us some examples of how or, yeah, how big of an issue is this for our community, especially AAPI and or AAPI and LGBTQIA+. I think part of it is, well, starting from the AAPI perspective, we're taught uh, I was taught is you don't complain, you don't bring things up. You're you're supposed to be the model citizen, and so that challenge of like being honest with your healthcare professional and just let them know some things aren't right here. And I had no problem when I was talking to my physicians for my parents, but they themselves didn't diagnose what was happening. And if I had to do it over, I would have been more aggressive and say, look, they need to be screened. These are not normal. Because they just chalked everything up to like, oh, it's just normal aging. Like, no, he's getting day and night mixed up and he can't remember that he's eaten already. Those are not normal. 
And so I think we need better education of our healthcare professionals as well. Um, that's one of the things the association is working for too is that you know we have 10 uh, like clinics area, area hospitals in the U in California which are accessible for doctors so they can better educate themselves on the disease. And so I think part of it is having physicians be educated more about the disease and that way they can do more of a service for their clients because most of them are afraid of giving that diagnosis to a client. It's like, oh my God, this just opens up a whole kettle of worms. Like, okay, what happens? Because it's almost like getting a breast cancer diagnosis and it's like, okay, what do I do now? So the same thing is like when you think, wait, something's gone wrong with my brain. What do I do next? So having the infrastructure in place to have people like, okay, there are places you can go, you can get information. And unfortunately, we don't have a cure now, but we do have things that are on the horizon that look very promising for us, at least to kind of stabilize people's lives. So there is some exciting things in science, but within the AAPI, AAPI community, it's like, for me growing up, it was like Chinese herbalist was number one. You never went to the Western doctor. So after he took your pulse, then you get tea, which you have to brew. And the best part of that was having raisins to wash it down with. But it was like, okay, this is, to me, that was normal. And I still think that way now. Like, if I don't feel well, I think I'd rather go to a Chinese doctor because at least I can figure out what's not in balance as opposed to going to a physician and he just gives you pills that normally would just not help the problem, but just kind of like make you live with it. So it, it's a different approach to kind of science as well, but also being open to the fact that, okay, Western medicine isn't all bad. It can help you, and you can educate yourself so you know what's going on. Thank you. Sure. Charmin? Um, I think around 40% of older adults who are LGBTQ would say that their providers don't know their sexual orientation. Mm. And so that's a big barrier yeah. to having some of these conversations um, that are really critical with physicians. There is a bit of a movement um, at UCSF. There's a program called Dementia Care Aware that's trying to educate physicians more on doing cognitive screens at um, you know wellness checks for older adults. And there are some policies in California that require providers to be trained um, on sexual orientation, gender identity, so as to not uh, you know, uh, offer or act in any discriminatory way when they're working with patients, but certainly more needs to be done in that area. And I think for older adults who, um, you know, are already at the point of living in hospice or long-term care settings, it can be quite terrifying for them if they have to go back into the closet um, to receive the kind of treatment um, or services that, um, you know, uphold their dignity in those settings. And so that's, that's a big barrier too. Very insightful, 40%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very high. Um, let's go to our audience questions and thank you so much for submitting your questions for our speakers tonight. What is the advantage of knowing you or someone has Alzheimer's or dementia? Anyone on the panel here at the stage can answer. I think that way you can um, start um, learning more about the disease. And also like um, the research advances, now we have um, treatment options that um, it's going to benefit for people who have um, uh, diagnosis at early stage or in the MCI stage, that's mild cognitive impairment. And um, I think also uh, early diagnosis also give you enough time to make um, legal and financial planning, that's very really important. And also let people uh, know before you still can, you know, um, make your wishes known to the families instead of uh, waiting for the later stage and then um, other people make the decision for you. So um, sometimes it will cause some family um, have a difficult time, you know, not necessarily everybody had the same opinions of what should be then, and if you, the, the person with dementia in the early stages, they, they, they know it, and then they can learn about that, you know, 
eventually they will go to a later stage. They couldn't make the decision for themselves and who they trust. They want that person to make the decision for them or what's their wishes and, and those are important. And, and if they have in, enough time to build up the care support systems, it's especially um, important for the LGBTQ mm -hmm. communities because sometimes it's really hard for them. Yeah, great points. Thank you. Stan? I would think that um, I would like to know, because I've had actually had that question posed to me saying, okay, both your parents had dementia. What about yourself? Are you concerned about it? And from a personal perspective, I would like to know, because I would like to plan, and it's about quality of life. So the fact that if I knew the fact that, okay, this is progressing at this rate, and uh, as you mentioned, like putting your affairs in order and letting people know. So I think as a person who's kind of who's grown up and seen so many changes and advances in our science, it's nice to know I'm not afraid of science and the fact of the more we know about it and kind of get online, read, study of what's happening. I mean, we are, we're living in exciting times in terms of, of drugs and medications for us now. They're not cures, but they're keeping things stable right now. And if we could just have more quality time with our loved ones. That's all we ask for. And I would like the same thing for myself. Mm -hmm. You yeah. to add, German? I think, I mean, some of those points are, are, are so excellent. Um, you know, really gaining access to resources, um, not feeling so isolated and alone in the process uh, for both the person living with dementia, but also caregivers as well, knowing that there's support networks, resources, um, groups that you can share your experiences with others. So it's not so scary of a trajectory. The journey can be quite long um, and it's, it's not a, a linear pathway pathway either. And so uh, I think the more people can share their lived experiences, the more we can all better understand what supports and services need to be in place to support sort of all stages of it. And as Xiaorong mentioned, it's not just memory loss, it's behavior changes, decision making. So the, you know, for, for loved ones to communicate with each other, knowing helps them also better understand why the person is acting the way that they are, and it's probably not personal. Um, and, and so that helps alleviate some of the emotional distress and burden that, that can come with it, um, that, that can be hurtful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I think that's such an important point because when you get the early diagnosis, that you know this is behavior, it's because of the disease, not that the person just like, um, we know a lot of people accuse people like, are you stealing my thing? Because they put away the thing they forget about it oh. <laughs> and and they keep accusing other people steal their things or they have um, change of personality they get um, agitated easily or um, emo really get emotional and and those changes if you if the family living with the person doesn't realize it's a disease, they might feel like it, it's, it's something that this person is just, just like, why you act, act it like this way? And if you knowing this is a disease, if you avoid a lot of the family conflicts, um, so the the family will probably will learn that you know you are not supposed to argue with the person with dementia, and you know um, there's a lot of way that how you um, handling those behavior problems and how to communicate, and there's a lot of tips that the family can learn, and they they can just totally improve the quality of life. You realize that the disease, that's something that you cannot change, mm -hmm. but all you can change is the, the person without the disease to change their expectations and, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When well, we'll get to more tips too, especially mm -hmm. as we uh, begin to wind down in, in the program. Uh, another question, are there possibilities to diagnose Alzheimer's much earlier using biomarkers in the blood, for example? That's in the horizon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like, uh, biomarkers, uh, <laughs> we, we are making a lot of progresses, like we have um, PET scan for the two major hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, like A-beta proteins and also tau protein, and that's uh, making progresses in the, um, we can see the uh, what change in your brain, just like by um, doing some exam of your um, cerebral um, uh, spinal fluid or the blood. So those are, we are making uh, great progresses in research. 
and um, it's it's not clinical in, in your doctor's office right now, but it, we are very hopeful. Um, yeah. Yeah. I will hold on to that. <laughs> <laughs> and also maybe in the near future, and then you go to a, a, a doctor's office, they can you know, do an image of your retina, and then they mm -hmm. can see some changes in your brains. And those are um, a lot of researches are going on. Um, it's not, maybe you hear from the news, it's mostly like um, A beta antibodies that, that's in the pipeline in the clinical trial. But there's like um, over 140 um, different aspects of biological process in research is like in the clinical trial stage. So there's a many aspects of disease is making progress. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Progress. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll have you back on in a couple months to talk about <laughs> much, yeah. where we're at. Okay, another question. With people living longer, how much more prevalent will Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia become? Well, this is an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, this is an age-related disease, so mm -hmm. um, your, your risk increases with your age. So like with the um, advances of the medical um, medicine um, um, advances right now, people are living longer and longer. Like in Chinese, we have an old saying, you know, when you're over 70, it's really rare. Yeah. Um, but now you look around, you see people in 80s, 90s, yeah. and even 100. There's more and more people living longer. So um, Alzheimer's disease is going to be more, you know, uh, more and more people getting it. And we need to um, educate um, the public and raise the awareness that, you know, um, maybe in the past you don't hear that much that people talk about it, but like there's more and more people will, you know, talk about it and, you know, learn more about it. And that's, um, we, we, we very, um, really, really happy in seeing this chance that, yeah, more people talk about it. Like we come out tonight in these programs, and and there's an, a lot of this opportunity to um, raise the awareness. Yeah. Thank you, doctor, for saying that we are coming out during Pride Week to talk about Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Yes. And our community members. Um, anyone else to add to to that in terms of? Yeah, I might increase just, numbers. Yeah, I might just add that um, it's definitely, you know, age is one of the biggest risk factors, but many other social determinants are also involved when we're talking about Alzheimer's disease. And with the, uh, you know, growing aging population, we're going to see the prevalence increase much more too. So among uh, almost every racial, racial ethnic group and LGBTQIA populations in California, the numbers are going to double by 2040. And so, you know, we have a lot of planning to do as a society in terms of what do we need to change in terms of policies and practices to really support, you know, an aging population and also growing numbers of people living with dementia. And, and you know, I'm talking about things like housing, transportation, employment, child care. And we really have to look sort of across generations as well at policies to think about how we want to holistically support society because, these are big trends, and we're all living with it. So um, I think it, it, they're important issues for all of us to think about. This question is really important. It's actually um, dovetails with another question that I had that I was going to ask as we wind down. But going back to the healthcare conversation, you know, question, I mean, once you get diagnosed and treated, what does treatment look like? And then especially with Medicare and Medicaid, Right. I mean, I, I just think that if we have to make those changes and the numbers are doubling by 2040, the time is now to make some of those policy changes if we have to make them. So maybe I know this is a very lengthy oh. conversation. It's probably another program, <laughs> but perhaps you can choose one or two points when it comes to looking at the you know, current access to treatment, what treatment looks like now, right. what cost looks like now. Well, what's covered, what's not covered, what would you change? That's Doctor? the great point. I think Alzheimer's Association is advocating the um, Medicare, Medicare cover the new um, FDA approved um, treatments, but um, uh, the, the two monoclonal antibody that we have FDA approval, um, it, the uh, Medicare is not going to cover it and, unless people register it. Uh, in the registry, in the uh, get uh, research um, programs, and and 
we hope that um, they make the changes. And um, so the registry is not a requirement. It will be accessible for everybody needed to that treatment. Decision, the decision shouldn't be made by the FDA. It should be made by the uh, patient and the doctors. I think this is really important. Yeah. Stan. As she was just mentioning, right, the CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medi-Cal Studies, they have not approved these two drugs, which means if somebody wants access because they have early onset, they have to pay out of pocket because insurance won't pay for it and Medicare won't pay for it. So the idea in, is that it's going to be expensive for someone to take this drug. Um, you're asking how much it's going to cost. It's 26000 Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Uh, for the for one the, medication. For one year. What I'm hearing, though, is was research is going on that eventually they're looking at the fact that it's going to be more than just one drug, and it may be a combination of drugs is what they're looking at. But right now, we're better off than we were a year ago. We have, we have two drugs, but we need to figure out how people are going to get up to, to pay for it because what's happening now is 2,000 people a day move from early onset to the next level of yeah. Alzheimer's. So that means more lost families and just and more futures. So if we can just code people on pause, put them on pause and just kind of move forward. That was all we're, we're asking for right now. But the CMS is dragging their feet. Yeah. And I might add, you know, a hope for a cure is great, but I'd like to focus our attention on care um, because people are living with dementia now. And, and there's so many areas where we can invest to create a more friendly and inclusive environment for people to live in with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Um, and just to give you an example of some of the social costs, I mean, for caregivers, um, you know, they're spending out of pocket about $10,000 a year caring for a loved one with dementia. And the cost for employers is quite heavy too because caregivers have to step out of the workforce to care for their loved ones and employers have to retrain and rehire. So that comes with the cost as well. So beyond just the cost of, of Medicare, Medicaid, um, you know, they're, they're quite extreme social costs as well that we should think about. Um, and so I, I'm a big advocate for for more care. <laughs> you know, we want a cure, but but that that's not going to be an immediate fix. So what can we fix? And I think it really is in the in the care realm. Stick with that a little bit, um, <laughs> especially we're talking about AAPI, right? And even LGBTQIA plus. I think my mother has kind of silently designated me as if anything happens, you're the one because a, you have no family of your own mm -hmm. and you're not going to have a family <laughs> of your own. It's assumed. Right. And two, I mean, it's the Asian thing. You're, I'm never going to go to any care facility. Oh, like that's just the no, no in our, our culture. Um, I kind of feel like we're, really behind the times now here if we're not addressing this from the intersectional perspective of changing the way care looks like. So it's a two-sided question. What could we be doing more to support caregivers, especially in the Asian community? And then uh, secondly, I mean, it's a loaded question. Are we, are, we in, or are we behind the times? Are we in trouble here by not providing uh, very specific care for Asian caregivers, I should say, or Asian families? I would say overall, it's just caregivers overall just need to have access to better education mm -hmm. because I had wonderful Filipina caregivers, but they didn't know what to do. And I wish more information was in Tagalog to help them to show that, okay, and I was actually, things that I had learned from group was like, don't correct the person you're caring for. Don't say, you've already said that, or, you know, it, it just, it upsets them. If they say the color is green, the sky is green, then it's green. And one of the, the wonderful things of caregiving uh, that I went to was the fact is the three words, the new normal. So what was normal yesterday may not be the normal today. And you need to kind of be flexible and realize that you're going to have to go along with this ride with this person. So... You know, you have to kind of redirect and learn some of the skills. But for caregivers, 
is to learn that information so that they can be a better caregiver, they can be happier who they're caring for, and the person who has dementia has a better quality of life because it is challenging for that person as well. They're confused and it's like they're, there's all kinds of little techniques and that comes from like going to, to an Alzheimer's caregiver support group because it's like, I mean, I couldn't wait every month until I had my list of questions like, what do I do now? It's like, <laughs> they're doing this. It's like, you know, they're waking up at two o'clock in the morning. They're, it's just like, it, there's just crazy things they're doing. And it's like, okay. I mean, one of the ones I had was uh, the caregiver called and said, you need to talk to your dad. I goes, what's going on? He says, he's just taking all the sheets off the bed. He says, there are knives in the bed. And so I got my dad on the phone and I would be like the one person that could calm him down and I would just say, well, what's going on? He goes, oh, there are knives in the bed. And I said, well, what'd you do? He goes, well, I took the sheets off. I go, well, are there any knives there now? He goes, no. He goes, so it's okay now? I go, yeah, it's okay. You can put the sheets back on. And just kind of reassuring that voice and just going like, okay, instead of saying you're crazy and just say that's not true, you just go, okay, live in their life and just go, oh, we've taken care of it. We've taken all the knives out. And then you just go, move on. Mm. But it's learning those skills that you just, that to me now seems second nature. Like, okay, what do you do if this happens? It's like, try to find a creative solution around it. My dad could not figure out morning and evening. He would just, he would wake up and think that two in the morning is two in the afternoon. So I got him a clock that actually would say morning, afternoon, or night. So if he looks at it, you know, the caregiver goes, oh, look, it's this time now, because he would get confused. But it's like, think of creative solutions as a caregiver, because it is challenging. And so I think with the Asian pop, with the Asian community, it's getting them to realize that they can ask for help because we're like proud. We don't have to ask for help. We, we know it all. It's like, no, you need to learn these skills if you want to be happy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. Sure. Jarman. Yeah, no, it, I'm glad you brought up intersectionality because um, I think that that is, it, we really do need to think about some of the intersections. Um, you know, about uh, one in five older adult who is LGBTQ is also a person of color. And so when we're thinking about services and supports and programs, you know, we really have to think about whether or not it's culturally appropriate and language concordant as well. Um, are the service providers also trained to understand and meet those needs at the various intersections. And so I think part of it is, is really trying to center the margins, tell more of the stories from these intersections, because it is quite nuanced. And um, even people living with dementia are very, um, very diverse. And, and most are living with comorbid conditions, meaning they're also managing other illnesses. So dementia is not um, not a, a def it define, doesn't define who they are. And so I think those are really important points. The other piece about caregiving, too, I just wanted to bring up is, you know, we really also should think about, you know, like the direct care workforce and other um, caregivers that have to be part of the picture for us to really make ends meet and to really support society, um, you know, growing older in these ways. And so there are many different training programs. The state of California has CalGROW's program to, to train more direct care workers to come into this field, dementia training being part of the training that they have to receive. But I just want to highlight that, um, you know, it's largely women and people of color who do this work. And so again, we have intersections at, at every level that we really have to think about and how do we um, coexist and, and, and work together knowing that we have all of these differences, but also we have much in common as well. So I just wanted to really highlight and, and appreciate that, that call out to intersectionality. Thank you so much. We got time for um, a couple more questions. I'll end with mine, but one uh, question, or I guess statement a viewer online made was around diet. And they had made the statement that, you know, more processed food and red meat can, can be a higher risk factor. So I guess I turn to doctor. <laughs> Could you verify? Yeah, I think it's the, um, the over processed, um, Food is, is like increase your risk of getting dimensions. Uh, so we have a um, uh, 
community education programs that we have a lot. And one of them is healthy living for your brain and body. Just talk, talk about how, you know, um, different aspects of things that you can do that modifiable factors. Um, um, it's one is the uh, uh, diet that you mentioned. So healthy diets like the uh, Mediterranean diet or DASH diet and those high in vegetable and fruits and fibers and then less red meats and then you know healthy um oil like vegetable oil olive oil and those anything that's um good for your heart is going to be good for your brains because um our brain is so sensitive to the um, blood surprise um you know other each time the heart um uh, pump out the the blood to to supply the um oxygen and nutrition to the body, 25% um, go to the um, brain. So anything's good for your heart is going to be good for your brain health. And then so if you are, have diabetes or, or high blood pressure or high cholesterol and just, you know, go see a doctor and, you know, listen to the doctor and take medicine to control it within the normal levels. And then um, besides diet and exercise is good. Um, you can start any time. Um, it's never too late to start. So um, any level of exercise is going to be good for you. Um, it could You could try 15 minutes like um, five days a week, although slowly you can increase. And also um, challenge your brains. Um, this is like um, learn something new. Um, and also um, get enough sleep, quality sleep. <laughs> um, it, it's not necessarily the, the, the length of the sleep, it's the quality of the sleep that's important. Um, also, um, uh, it's the um, social connection is important. I think it's probably um, more important for the LGBTQ um, community because they are, are more likely to live lonely. Um, I have a less support of family, so um, I think it's important to raise the awareness um, things you could do to, you know, um, reduce your risk. Um, research have shown that, um, Jamin have mentioned, 40% of dementia is, is preventable. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for, um, um, for raising the public awareness of these factors. Yeah. Thank you so much, Doctor. I think that leads me to my last question anyway, which was going to be is the hope for a cure, but we already heard the answer. Not Yes, that would be great, but we have uh, things that we need to prioritize, which is quality, the quality of life, right? Uh, so we already heard that uh, you know some things, what not to do would be to argue with somebody who's been diagnosed or tell them they're crazy. I hate that word anyway. Um, let's not do that. But well, why don't we end the program with a couple things that you could do to make it a much more kinder, compassionate environment for all of us so that we could really start to do the work in creating that space for holistic, full-on you know, care for those with Alzheimer's, dementia, and also our caretakers. Can't forget the caretakers. Um, I'm going to start with Stan just because you get, Stan gave me this card oh, yes. back there in the, the green room, and I thought it was is just the best. Stan, what is this card? It's the Alzheimer's Association. It's the courtesy card. So when you're out there with caring for somebody, and it's always a challenge because you're not sure if the person you're caring for is just going to like get confused, start acting up, you could hand the server this card or a service person this card, which explains the fact that you know, you're with someone who does have dementia and that if you could just show a little bit extra kindness and it just lets the person know that, okay, this is this person does not normally act this way. So please have a little bit more compassion with them. And it just kind of just gives them the heads up. And a lot of people would just go, oh, okay, that's why. And I mean, it is always challenging. And that's the problem as a caregiver where, you know, when you take someone out and also they just, they just kind of go off the, the deep end, and you're just trying to rein them in, and you go, I'm not going to go through this again. They're not going out. Well, that's the worst, because when they social isolation just makes their world just smaller, and that was an unfortunate thing during during COVID. I mean, during group, we would talk about the fact that there's some, they would take like their person they're caring for out to senior center or, or uh, memory clinics, but they couldn't do that. 
So their world was just looking at television and each other. And so I think the idea that, you know, of having tools such as you know, the courtesy card of like, here's the person I'm caring for. And also just learning the other tools that are available. We have literature on that for caregivers. And it just, it makes it easier for everybody to get along and especially the support team. Within our the uh, LGBT community, I think if one was to get a diagnosis of that is start setting up your plan of friends who could help you, who could be the one that could take you to the doctor's appointment when they take away your keys and also for long-term planning, who can make those decisions for you? Because a lot of people are by themselves and especially if they're older and living in SROs, it's like they become so isolated and also they may die alone, so they shouldn't have to do that. And so just check in on, on your friends and neighbors, especially the elderly, and just say, okay, you know, I'm here for you. And it's just not something I just say, but the fact is that's something that you would actually do for them and help them out. Mm. Love that. Jarman? I'd say that, um, you know, people living with, with Alzheimer's disease and dementia, they might just be living in a different social reality than, than us. And so I think starting where they are is a really important thing instead of trying to get them to live in our reality, maybe meeting them where they are in their reality is, is a good place to begin. There's been a lot of great um, uh, arts-based programming that has been quite effective with people living with dementia. Music and the arts really um, is, is, is doing incredible work and it's great for brain health and it's great for engagement. Um, so that, you know, that's another alternative to sort of the biomedical model that's trying to intervene on the body, but really trying to uh, you know, work holistically with the person. Um, and then certainly, you know, we can all do things like eat better and exercise more. Um, I think we're, we're told that throughout our whole lives. Uh, but, you know, I'd like to push back and also have us question, you know, are there safe places for you to go? Are there green spaces? Do you feel like um, this, you know, you live in an environment or a neighborhood that you can be safe in? Or do you fear being attacked? Do you fear uh, racist encounters? Do you fear transphobia in your neighborhood or in your community? And that can really lead to more isolation um, that is, you know, puts one at higher risk of, of, of dementia. So again, looking at our social and physical environments I think is really important. Um, and then I think the other point I'd make is, you know, there, there are lots of great programs, especially here in San Francisco, um, that can help um, improve, you know, more engagement and outings. Um, Open House and Onlock have a great mm -hmm. collaboration, and they created a, an adult day program called Club 75, which is fantastic. And, you know, programming like that, we know reduces things like hospitalizations, inpatient stays. So those are all health-promoting activities that we really need more of. Of, uh, more access to. Um, those kinds of programs come with transportation as well, which is also another critical component when we're thinking outside the clinic for how do we better support people living with dementia as well as caregivers. So it, it's, it's all of that connective stuff of how do we keep people in the community moving around, living their best lives, and really bolstering their quality of life, not sacrificing their personhood um, if they're living with dementia. I think that's a great note to end with. <laughs> I think that's perfect. But uh, doctor, any any last thoughts? I I, I think it's important to just uh, um, to uh, to raise the public awareness. It should not just the family affected by the disease or they already have signs. It's for the whole community. It's like we have to build a community that's LGBTQ inclusive and you know Alzheimer and dementia friendly. Um, so we have like Alzheimer's Association have like um, walk to end Alzheimer's or uh, the longest day. Those um, it's not just to raise funds. It's more important, in, in my opinion, is to raise the public awareness. Well, I thank all three of you for being up here and giving us your time, lending us your time and your your courage and of course your intellect and experiences with the rest of us to better inform us. So let's thank our speakers tonight. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Can I make one, one quick comment? Oh, yes. yes. Um, just as resources, there are two registries that might be of interest to the audience. One is the RISE registry. RISE is an acronym that stands for Research Inclusion Supports Equity. Um, and they're seeking to get over 1,000 LGBTQIA adults uh, involved in this registry who would be interested in participating in Alzheimer's and dementia research. And the second registry is called CARE Registry, which is also an acronym that stands for Collaborative Approach for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islander Research and Education. And they are seeking to create um, a registry of over 10,000 AAPI uh, older adults and, and uh, their loved ones who might be interested interested in participating in research, so. Thank you so much, Charmin. And can you find those links again at uh, alz.org? Uh, maybe. Um, yeah. yeah. Are those, do you know I if those think, registries are linked? I think it, it should yeah. have that. They can, um, Alzheimer's Association offer a lot of uh, resources yeah. that um, people can either call this 800 number that's 24 seven. You can call anywhere, anytime within the United States. And there's always um, a person on the other end to answer your question, not an answering machine. And that person have the, um, at least a master um, degrees, the level of conditions on the other end. So um, you don't have to have a problem. It's sometimes a caregiver can call, you know, after the person with the disease, then um, go to back, and then um, the caregiver just have time and want to talk to somebody, and you can call the helpline. That's perfect. It's alz.org. And again, thank you so much to our speakers tonight. Thank you to the Alzheimer's Association. Thank you to the Commonwealth Club for having us here, both in person and online. I'm Michelle Miao. For more programs here at the Commonwealth Club, you can visit commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. Happy Pride Month. Be kind to one another. We've heard that before in another TV show, but here you hear it again. But most importantly, let's make it a much more compassionate world. We'll see you next time.